good morning, everyone. Nice and early. And um, it's an absolute pleasure for me to join you this morning. And uh, I see quite a few registrars here, and I hope that I've got uh, at least some learning points for you. But the talk this morning is actually going to be more on the uh, publication we had this year uh, in the NHM uh, on the two-year outcomes on hemophilia aging therapy. It's an exciting field that we are involved in, and, and certainly uh, it's real. Uh, for those of you who watch a lot of movies, it's, this is actually happening in human beings. It's, it's not fictitious. And uh, if I could get, there you are. So these are my conflict of interest disclosures reflecting largely my interface with uh, a fairly large number of sponsors of uh, clinical studies that we do. And in today's uh, presentation, I will give uh, an overview of gene therapy from a global perspective so that at least you know where we are. And then I'll take you through the, the two year outcomes of the gene therapy that uh, we published earlier on. Uh, I mean, gene therapy has been around for over uh, 70 years. And we do know that uh, it, it has gone through uh, a number of um, you know, failures and some of them actually very disastrous. You know, the, the very first patient who had gene therapy uh, with uh, uh, common variable immunodeficiency died. And that sort of dampened the spirit and, and people never wanted to try. Um, uh, until somewhere in 2014, as you can see in this graph uh, from uh, ASGCT, uh, that uh, the interest actually started to rise. In fact, as I speak now, and I'll show you the figures, we've got a very large number of clinical trials that are ongoing. This is data from actually this quarter of 2023. Uh, showing clearly uh, over 2,000 gene therapies that are currently uh, either being evaluated at different phases of development or about to be to be approved. Uh, we've got about six, seven at any given time. Um, it is an exciting field and certainly something that, in fact, some of us latched onto a couple of years ago, uh, about five years ago. But I think the most important thing, I think, is this particular statement. Uh, globally, currently, we've got about 24 gene therapies that have been approved uh, by FDA, EMA, the Japanese uh, authorities, and many other authorities. We've got about 22 RNA therapies, and that includes, of course, um, the recent COVID RNA therapies that we know about, and, and in excess of 61 cell therapies that have been approved to date. I mean, some of you, and in fact, I think one of many, many of you have heard of CAR T cells. Um, you know, it's, it's the buzzword in, uh, in both inside and outside oncology. Talking about oncology, in fact, uh, most of these gene therapies have actually been formulated uh, in the context of oncologic diseases. Uh, you can see here that uh, we've got in excess of 300 such therapies with the, uh, the CAR T cell CD19 leading the pack. Uh, in fact, if you don't have a CAR T cell and you're a practicing uh, hematologist, oncologist, you, you are regarded as being a little bit backward uh, in a way. Um, uh, what we are particularly interested in is the non-oncologic gene therapy. In fact, in this particular figure, you can see that um, the bleeding disorders, namely hemophilia A, is leading the pack. Uh, amongst the non-oncologic gene, th uh, gene therapies that are currently evolving. Uh, and in fact, uh, we, we are involved in all 13 of those. Uh, and and of, to some extent, we're involved in the factor nine gene therapy, which you know, needs a, a talk on its own. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is hemophilia A, which is factor eight deficiency, but hemophilia B is much more exciting uh, for a number of perspectives. And if we've got time at the end, I'll give you a perspective as to why we, we think that it actually doesn't deserve much uh, attention now because it's actually set up and, and it, will, it will evolve over time. Um, perhaps for the non-hematologist in the audience, I, I want to remind you uh, that the, the reason gene therapy is appropriate for uh, hemophilia is because it is a genetic condition with mutations uh, in the relevant clotting factors, factor eight and factor nine. And in fact, we'd like to think of gene uh, of hemophilia as failure 
of thrombin generation. Uh, in some textbooks, uh, you know, some of those who uh, read uh, the, uh, the CNA uh, textbooks, uh, uh, Hayes can note and on all of those, uh, you, 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 it's described as uh, the ballerina of hemostasis. And, and the ballerina being obviously the central uh, character. And, and, and the absence of thrombin as a result of uh, the mutation in the factor eight and the factor nine gene, uh, one actually gets bleeding as opposed to thrombosis. Of course, that is in the context uh, of uh, an otherwise intact hemostatic system uh, comprising of all of the natural anticoagulants, including tissue factor pathway inhibitor shown here, the antithrombin and protein C. And in fact, one of the exciting error in, in, our, in the current therapeutic landscape uh, in hemophilia, we're developing therapies that are aiming for the tissue factor pathway, antithrombin uh, and, and protein C. These are monoclonal antibodies. Uh, currently, in fact, we're doing all of those studies uh, here at at Charlotte McGregor. Uh, so, so the long and the short is, uh, if you understand this, you'll then start to understand why patients with hemophilia bleed. If the typical phenotype is bleeding into any tissue, but the whole mark is actually hemarthrosis, bleeding into joints, uh, as you can see in this particular picture here. And, and, and naturally, uh, repeated bleeding into joints lead to irritation of the synovium, leading to chronic synovitis. And luckily, it doesn't happen in every patient. In fact, it happened in a subset of patients. And those patients, naturally, if you do uh, anything or you do nothing, they will progress to hemophilic arthropathy. Um, the, the, the two joints you're seeing here in the third picture are, in fact, a typical hemophilic arthropathy that we see. Uh, in our patients. And of course, uh, radiologically, one sees a destroyed joint. Um, no, there is no joint space there. And, uh, and in most cases, these patients, in fact, do not have any functional joint. And the good news is that this destructive cascade can be halted with replacement therapy. In other words, if you replace the missing protein, factor eight or factor nine, uh, you could literally slow down this process. And our understanding of the natural history of hemophilia is that it doesn't matter what you do. In fact, uh, that really fast bleed will naturally lead to hemophilic arthropathy. It might take a bit longer if you've got active intervention, you've got prophylaxis, which we regard now as the standard of care. And talking about replacement therapy, we've come a long way. Uh, in the last uh, you know, five or six decades, uh, you know, we used to use blood and blood products. Uh, that has evolved over time we, uh, with the DNA technology in the 1980s to recombinant products and clotting factor concentrates. And more recently, in fact, uh, we've had about six or seven uh, you know, recombinant proteins uh, with modified pharmacokinetics, the so-called extended half-life products. And, and that has been absolutely exciting in the field. In fact, for a long time, we thought, okay, you know, patients with hemophilia uh, have reached the dead end. But uh, simultaneously with this um, evolution, in fact, we, we are seeing even better therapies, as I indicated earlier on. We've got a large number of non-factor replacement therapy. Um, the limitation with all of these replacement therapies therapy are many, and I've listed three here. The one uh, that's probably the most important and the most feared is immunogenicity, the development of neutralizing antibodies against the protein you are replacing. So, so the patient will be cruising along every time they bleed, you give them the factor, and suddenly the factor doesn't work because they've got neutralizing antibody against the factor, the, the so-called inhibitor. Uh, not only is it feared, but it's extremely expensive uh, at the end of the day. The second one is, is um, some of you may not have been exposed to our clinic. By the way, we run a clinic Monday to Friday uh, 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 in 294. Uh, if you want to come and visit, in fact, you'll see all of these patients there. The patients, in fact, 99% of our patients can put up a trip and uh, give themselves intravenous infusion of the factor. But that is burdensome. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you need, uh, obviously, to be committed to treating yourself as a patient, or the family needs to be committed to treating their child. But more importantly, uh, because we have embraced prophylaxis as the standard of care, uh, what invariably happens is that instead of the patients giving themselves regular 
infusion to prevent the bleeds, then they start giving up because their veins, in fact, uh, have given up. Just to give you an indication, uh, this typical regimen of prophylaxis is an infusion three times a week. Now, you'll agree with me that if you're giving um, infusion three times a week, uh, you know, three times 20 years, we're talking about 3,120 infusions into a vein that wasn't meant to be cannulated 3,120 times. That's what I mean by the treatment burden. And that, of course, leads to non-adherence. But the, the third one is every time you give factor, you rise, the, the factor level in the body rises. And then over time, naturally, it will come down. Uh, and that's what we call peaks and troughs. Uh, and the reality with hemostasis is that you can't afford to have peaks and troughs. Uh, if you do have peaks and troughs, the troughs are the areas of vulnerability. That's when you get breakthrough bleeds. That's when patients, in fact, they'll be watching TV and then there's blood coming out of their eyes, for example. Uh, I've got a picture of one such patient, by the way. Um, so, so the reality is the large number of unmet needs with replacement therapy. And we'd like to believe that in fact therapy uh, may well be able to address all of these uh, unmet needs. Just to remind you that uh, you know, gene therapy in its current form uh, is largely based on AV-mediated gene transfer. And, and the reason we've chosen adeno-associated virus uh, are listed there. It's a small single standard uh, DNA-based power virus. It's only got two viral genes that we can toss out of the capsid uh, and then uh, remain with the capsid that you can then populate with your transgene of interest. It causes. Um, and the good news, of course, is because it doesn't cause any disease, we can actually then repurpose it. Uh, to be a vehicle by which we use to deliver the gene. And the third one uh, is that, in fact, um, it's not a complex uh, structure. Uh, it's, it's only got about, you know, 74% uh, uh, protein and 26% and DNA. Uh, and, and, and in fact, it's, it's probably one of the most simple structures that one can come across uh, in, in the size that we're talking about. Uh, and there are limitations with it. And shown on uh, the right here is, is a typical, you know, adeno-associated virus. Uh, we've got a number of sero serotypes around the world. In fact, uh, it's interesting in South Africa, the commonly used uh, you know, AV is the AV5. And the highest prevalence of AV5 around the world is actually in South Africa. And I'll tell you what, what we're doing to go past that uh, at the end of the day. But I mean, this is a typical uh, adenovirus um, um, uh, uh, adeno associated virus, that one. And, and of course, the mechanics of uh, gene therapy, and this is for the, the registrars, uh, is, is much, much simpler than you think. We, we take the adenovirus uh, as it is, uh, we toss out the rep and cap genes. Those are the only two genes that they have. And then we put in a, a, a transgene cassette comprising of the gene of interest. In this case, it will be a factor 8 cDNA together with the relevant promoter. The promoter is modified such that it's got tissue specificity. In our case, in fact, it's got high affinity for the liver. And of course, the relevant enhancers. And then, of course, um, you know, as an outpatient, uh, this is in uh, room uh, 31, uh, area 454, the patients come in, uh, we infuse it uh, over a period of two hours. Um, what happens when it gets into the body? Um, uh, naturally, this is speculative because we have not studied this in detail, but we think that you know, it finds its way to uh, the liver, in the liver, it gets um, uh, internalized. Uh, uh, in that process, it gets uh, you know, uh, released. Uh, the DNA gets released. Uh, and it, in fact, it sits episomally. It never integrates. And I'll talk to the integration issue going forward. Um, it sits episomally in the nucleus, and it uses all of the machinery of the liver to start producing proteins. And in fact, in about four to six weeks, uh, you start seeing the factor eight in the patient's body going up. Uh, and that is actually extremely exciting, by the way, when you see it for the first time. And, and that's basically the mechanics of gene therapy. And, and the exciting bit is that um, it, this particular area has been growing 
in leaps and bounds. Um, I'm showing you four of um, the publications in high impact journals that have uh, recently been published. And I'm not going to take you through all of them because uh, each one of them is unique. Some of them are phase one, some of them are phase two. And, and I'm just going to talk about this particular one, which is a phase three study uh, that we published earlier this year, uh, following up the, the, the phase uh, three study that we published uh, last year, uh, which was the first year of gene therapy. This is actually the second year of gene therapy. And I'll show you the results of that uh, uh, you know, study. So what was the study design? Relatively straightforward uh, study design. And the, and, and the objective here was to evaluate the safety and efficacy of Balactocogene Roxapavovec when compared to the standard of care, which is factor eight prophylaxis. And if you look at um, the dose that each patient received, a very high dose, uh, six times 10 to the 13 vector genome per kilogram. Uh, as a single infusion, as I say, as an outpatient uh, over a period of two hours. Uh, who was included? Uh, there were two cohorts of individuals that we included. Uh, a very small cohort of individuals of about 22 uh, were actually directly enrolled into the study. And then the larger cohort of 112 were individuals that we had followed um, uh, for about uh, six to 12 months uh, to gather data for the purposes of comparison. In other words, their bleed rates, uh, how, how often did they bleed, how much factor did they use, et cetera, et cetera, so that we can see the impact of gene therapy once they had received that. Uh, and in fact, the eligibility criteria were very simple. They needed to be uh, uh, adult individuals, uh, 18 and above, uh, with severe hemophilia. They needed to be on some form of factor eight prophylaxis because that is actually the standard of care. We can't compare it to anything else other than the standard of care. And they of course needed to have no inhibitors that I alluded to that is actually a, a limitation in replacement therapy. And then of course we, we did a large number of screening on these patients to identify those with without pre-existing anti-AV antibodies. And, and in fact, a large number, I'm talking about almost 150 of our patients went through the screening. We identified about 60 uh, of, our, of our patients. And we, because this is a liver-directed gene therapy, we just wanted to make sure that there was no liver pathology uh, uh, existing at the time when we're doing gene therapy. You can imagine if you're doing a gene therapy in someone with liver cirrhosis, it just won't work because the capacity of the liver, the liver is limited. And then of course, the, uh, the, for the first year, uh, we thought you know, the most reasonable thing to use as an endpoint was the factor eight level rising. Um, and in fact, that's what we did. Um, when we consulted with FDA, uh, FDA didn't like the idea anymore, and, and for a number of reasons. Uh, they decided that in fact, in the second year analysis, we must actually look at the bleed rates. And the reason, the main reason why they moved away from the factor level, in part, is because uh, a large number of patients showed variability. And one could not objectively tell if, in fact, gene therapy was effective. Whereas if you looked at a patient who was a bleeder six months to a year before, and you compare them to post-gene therapy, you can easily tell if they bleed or they don't bleed. And that is the context in which, in fact, the FDA advises. And of course, all of these patients now, um, and I'll show you the data, uh, some of them are into their third year post-gene therapy, some of them are into their fourth year of gene therapy, and the intention is to follow them long term to see what the effect of the gene therapy is going to be uh, in these patients. And, and, and I've summarized here the baseline characteristics of the patients we analyzed at the end of the second year, um, uh, relatively uh, straightforward cohorts. The intention to treat cohort is basically all the patients that were enrolled uh, from 78 centers uh, in uh, 46 um, countries around the world. Um, the modified intention to treat cohort is initially we included patients who are HIV positive, and we realized that in fact, some of the patients needed immunosuppression. And if you've got HIV and you also need immunosuppression, we could not tell what the impact of immunosuppression was going to be. So we took out the two patients that had HIV that in fact had already undergone um, um, uh, gene therapy. So the modified intention to treat is actually without HIV. These were all HIV negative. 
The rollover is the population that I alluded to. Uh, these are the patients from the, uh, the, the 270 uh, 902 study that was preceding the gene therapy study. And of course, a subset of these patients, as I indicated earlier on, about 17 of them, in fact, actually have data for three years and beyond. I've presented some of that data earlier this year in some of the congresses. Um, uh, and perhaps uh, I could go back here that we, we basically enrolled quite a, a large number of our patients uh, locally. Uh, we contributed a cohort that otherwise would not be seen in the context of gene therapy around the world. And, and you'll see that, in fact, we did not exclude patients with a past medical history of chronic infection, as long as that infection did not compromise liver structure and function. So if you've had a previous hepatitis A, B, or C, and you recovered from it, or you're immune to hepatitis, we could include you provided, um, you know, we could demonstrate um, you know, through uh, imaging that the structure was okay and the liver function, in fact, could be vouched for. Uh, we also uh, looked specifically at individuals' uh, joint status, as I showed you initially there. Uh, there was a variability there. Some patients had one, two, three, and more joints that were affected. We wanted to see, in fact, if there was any progression, in other words, from one joint to the next post-gene therapy uh, at the end of the day. Um, in fact, the age, as you can see, is a reflection of uh, the adult population that we looked at. And you'll agree that, you know, if you, someone is 30, they are relatively young. They are individuals that want to, you know, for the next 70 years, if they live up to 100, to actually have a relatively normal life. And, and I must admit that, in fact, some of those are looking at that prospect of having a normal life with a genetic disease uh, at the end of the day. So what were the results? Um, specifically, we looked at the annualized treated bleed rate comparing post-gene therapy uh, to factor eight prophylaxis. Uh, this is now the, uh, the, the subset of patients where the rollover from the 27902 the 112 patients, you can see here that in fact, um, if one looks at year one and year two, uh, the annualized bleed rate was very small, less than one bleed per annum, compared to when they were observed with the best standard of care, uh, they were getting five bleeds per annum. So we reduced that in fact almost by 100%. Um, if one looks at the proportion of individuals that did not bleed at all, it's a new parameter that we introduced about eight years ago uh, in our field to basically gauge the impact of the interventions we have for our patient. You can see that 82 and 84 for year one and year two respectively compared to 32%. Uh, in other words, a third of the patients who are receiving the best care that we could give uh, uh, did not have bleeds. In other words, two thirds of the patients were still bleeding with the best care. And as soon as they received gene therapy, uh, in fact, that number changed completely. And that is in fact, probably the reason why the FDA was interested in that. And if you look at the difference between 4.8 and year one and year two, you can see that in fact, it is statistically significant, 85% uh, reduction. And the median figures in fact, are consistent with those uh, mean figures that one sees. Um, if, if one looks at the utilization of replacement therapy or prophylactic use of the replacement therapy, uh, in fact, it has reduced. These are individuals that would wake up every morning and think about their hemophilia. And if their schedule says Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, you have to inject yourself. That's all they did in the morning. They injected themselves before they went out to work or school or whatever they wanted to do for that day. In fact, we reduce uh, their utilization of factor by 98% uh, at the end of the day. And that's quite actually quite significant. Uh, from uh, a factor of around uh, 3 1,961 to less than 50 uh, in year one and 88 in year two. And, and in fact, the reason it rises a little bit is because once patients notice that they don't bleed, of course, they become more adventurous. I mean, I know of bungee jumpers. I know of people who just decided that they'll go in and, 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 and enter races that I wouldn't enter uh, as, an, as a person with an intact hemostatic system, but they went ahead and, do, and, and did it. Um, so if one looked at... Um, a subset of those patients that went on, in fact, to year three. Remember I said 
there were a small subset of patients that we've now uh, analyzed. The results, in fact, are not different. 80% reduction in treated bleeds uh, by year three when compared to baseline, baseline being uh, the 27902 uh, cohort, uh, the rollover cohort. Uh, you can see here that, in fact, their bleed rates remain uh, run about one or less. Uh, at the end of the day. So essentially, we're talking about someone who bleeds once every 12 months compared to five bleeds uh, that they used to have on average. This is now with the best care that we're giving them uh, at the end of the day. And if one looks at um, the reduction uh, in the factor eight utilization at year three, uh, you can see that, in fact, it's creeping up a little bit. And, and as I say, part of it is because of personalities involved. Uh, these people were denied to be children they never played. They were told that you cannot be a normal child. And suddenly, uh, some of them as teenagers and some of them, in fact, as adults, they actually want to rekindle their childhood. Uh, they are doing things that they just could never do before. And, and that's probably the reason why you, you see the, the utilization rate going up a little bit. And in fact, uh, this is a slightly different perspective of the efficacy data that shows the factor eight activity as measured by the chromogenic substrate assay. When you send a, a tube, uh, a citrate tube to the lab, we usually use a one stage assay. The chromogenic assay is actually the global standard against which we calibrate the one stage assay. And the reason we don't use the chromogenic assay on a routine basis is because it costs an arm and a leg. It costs about uh, 10 to, to 15 times the one stage assay. And if you were to translate these figures, um, the chromogenic assay, um, in fact, to get the a uh, one stage assay, you multiply by 1.6 and you know, to get the right figure. So what you're seeing here is probably less than what I would may have measured uh, when they visited us here. But the bottom line here, in fact, what I wanted to show you, uh, this graph shows the mean factor eight activity as the function of time post gene uh, infusion. At the end of year one, the mean was 42% and the median was 24%. Uh, At the end of year two, uh, the mean was 23% and the median was 11%. Uh, all of us agree that the graph is self-explanatory. There's no doubt that you go through a peak and then it starts going down. And there are a number of reasons for that. And part of it is because you know you lose some of the, um, the transgene uh, uh, particles. Uh, and in fact, I'll show you a slide later uh, on our speculation of what processes take place in the liver uh, that may well result in this going down. And I must admit that this is unique to factor eight gene therapy. If I were to show you the factor nine gene therapy, uh, the factor nine rises and it stays the same consistently. And part of it is because the, uh, of the size of the factor eight uh, uh, you know, gene is, is huge. Uh, 2,332 amino acids. It's huge in size. And if you take a, an AAV that can only carry 4.7 kilo uh, basis of, of any material, uh, it makes sense that you sometimes, you know, we're probably overloading the AAV and, and, and therefore we're not going to get sustainable, um, you know, uh, expression over time. Of course, we've got plan B and plan C that uh, maybe I could, I could allude to the discussion. And perhaps for completeness sake, at the end of year three, that is the data that I presented recently uh, in the German Society of Thrombosis, uh, you can see that, in fact, there the continue to be a slight drop in the factor A. The good news, of course, is that these patients are born with a factor level of less than 1%. Three years down the line, they actually have not given themselves factor. They haven't bled. The majority of them have not bled uh, uh, post-gene therapy. So even though it might be dropping, we are seeing huge impact in, in the patient's of life, in the way, in fact, we manage them. We hardly see them. And, and two patients, in fact, I've had to send the police to go and collect them because they just refuse to come to hospital um, at the end of the day. No, I don't send police. Uh, we, we're very polite. We, we do ask them to come, please, because they are part of the study and we actually do want to collect data so that we understand what we've done to them at the end of the day. I think that the question in your mind now is how long will this last? Um, we don't know. 
Um, at the end of the day, uh, we think that there might be a, a period at which, in fact, the level levels up. In fact, if I showed you this data uh, and the year four data uh, towards um, the end of 156 and going into the year four data, it seemed to have leveled up at the end of the day. So we, we've taken someone with less than 1%, we've given them somewhere between 10 and 20% factor which by definition, uh, in fact, we've converted someone from a severe disease to a mild disease, uh, which often in fact is it's what most of us are aiming for uh, in hemophilia. So how long will it last? We don't know. Uh, we, we think that in fact, um, there will be a period at which it levels up and in fact, uh, uh, it lasts longer. We've done biopsies in our patients post gene therapy. Um, and, and, and in fact, we've demonstrated that even the ones that seem to have lost expression, they actually still have the, the, the AV uh, transgene in the liver. Uh, at the end of the day. So working on mechanisms on unlocking uh, the functionality of those transgenes so that they can actually be effectively expressed at the end of the day. And what I wanted to show you here is that um, in a subset of patients, in fact, we've gone on to look at them uh, on year four, and that's exactly what I was trying to describe earlier on, that you seem to get that leveling effect um, at the end of the day. And, and it's, it's somewhere between 10 and 20 uh, units, uh, factor eight uh, activity, uh, which essentially means that these patients can live a, a normal life. Of course, if they uh, were hit by a bus or they had to have operation, we need to top that up because normally uh, we don't operate on these patients unless the factor level is somewhere between 80 and 100% of what they've got, which is what you and I have without uh, hemophilia. And, 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 and of course, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, um, you know, the error bars seem to be very variable. This, these, of course, are the means, um, but the error bars are very variable. And the point being that they got the same dose, six times 10 to the 13 vector genome per kilogram. And the question is, why should there be so much variability? And we didn't see it only in uh, this uh, you know, generate one study. Uh, we saw it in other studies as well. For example, the, the BMN 270 uh, study, you can see the variability amongst the patients, both within the patients and between the patients. Uh, the SPARC 9001 study, uh, which got a slightly lower dose of five times 10 to the 11. Uh, in fact, these are individual patient for, uh, calves uh, showing the effector level as a function of time post gene therapy. You can see that in fact, there's a large amount of variability. We're beginning to understand some of that and in fact, theoretically, I think we've got a large number of uh, possibilities. The one is uh, we think that there may well be inconsistent efficiency uh, in the expression of the gene itself. In other words, um, each one of these um, you know, uh, transgene cassettes uh, may well have variability in the way uh, it has been packaged such that uh, th there will be variability in how each one of those transgenes is expressed in the liver once it reaches the liver. In other words, uh, codon uh, optimization is, is one feature that we're actually looking at. We want uh, quality assurance around that. We also uh, you know in the context of uh, uh, at least factor nine, uh, you know, the reason why it remain like that is that each of the factor nine gene therapies are using the so-called hyperactive variants, the Padua factor nine. Now the Padua factor nine, what it does, it basically, uh, it puts uh, gas onto the expression. Um, you know, you get 10 times what you normally get as a normal expression, and therefore you don't lose any expression. We have just formulated the first hyperactive factor eight variant, and, and we're about to put it into uh, one of the transgenes that are going to be obviously uh, you know, used in, in the future. And the second reason, it might be that the efficiency of gene transfer might not be what we think. No, we, we're injecting millions, uh, billions of particles into the body. The, the number of particles, by the way, we inject is more than the total number of cells that you and I have in our body. And, and it is possible that most of these, in fact, are not getting to where they want to, where we want them to go, uh, which is the liver. Uh, and of course, I mean, you, you guys are not familiar with this. Uh, post uh, gene therapy, we monitor the shedding of the viral particles. Uh, 
and so collect stool, semen, every body fluid that you can think of, we collect and we measure that over time and, and until we can't find anything. That's a requirement, by the way, uh, by the government. Um, uh, interesting enough, if you're doing gene therapy, uh, you report to two departments in government. One is the Department of Fishery and Forestry, which is responsible for all gen uh, genomic material in the country. And the other one, of course, is the Department of Health, SAPRA which uh, will then you know, give you uh, permission to conduct the study. So consistently, we have to show uh, wh where shedding is and how much. Uh, and of course, these are, these are uh, AAVs. We know that they are not pathogenic, but we still want to know how much people are shedding uh, during the course of the, um, the... And then the third one is the immune response. I mean, that, is not, that does not come as a surprise. In this room, uh, there will be some of us who uh, were exposed to COVID-19, never got serious infection. Some of us who were exposed to COVID-19 got serious infection. And that is a function of our immune system and, and other factors that are involved. And then the last one, we think that you know, this is epi episomal, but there may well be epigenetic factors that are contributing uh, to the expression. So, so once it's inside the nucleus, it, it is transcribed and translated, and then you see the protein in your blood that you measure. It is possible that in fact, epigenetic factors such as DNA methylation, histone modification, and others may play an important role uh, in that expression. And that is the way we would like to think. In fact, if some of you are looking for Nobel prizes and PhDs and all kinds of things, come and speak to me. I'll put you in the right direction uh, because we don't know much about this part of the world uh, at the end of the day. I want to switch over to probably the most important aspect of gene therapy, which is safety. Um, no, uh, we wouldn't do it if it was not safe. And that's the bottom line. At the end of the day, um, you know, gene therapy has to be safe. And the reason why we went through that period where there was complete stagnate, uh, uh, there was no progress at all until 2014 when it went up is because we could demonstrate that it was safe to uh, do gene therapy on any disease for that matter um, at the end of the day. And when you think about safety in the context of gene therapy, there are four factors that we look at. We look obviously standard uh, adverse events, uh, but we've also got a category of adverse events that we call uh, adverse events of special interest. Um, the two of my patients had their factor level over 400. So, so for, you, take, you take someone with a factor level of less than one, uh, and then you give them gene therapy and suddenly they've got 400, you worry about thrombosis. Um, and and, and it, so that is the adverse event of special interest that one is looking at. And of course, um, you know, um, the infusion reactions, et cetera. Immunogenicity, of course, the transgene derived factor eight. Uh, we want to see if the body mounts an immune response to it. Uh, touch wood, none of the patients, both in this program and in the other 13 programs have actually had uh, immunogenicity against the transgene derived factor eight. Of course, we do know that there's a 30% chance um, that you'll amount an immune response if you replace exogenously the factor eight uh, to the patient. In this case, the endogenously produced transgene derived factor eight doesn't seem to be immunogenic. And we don't understand that, by the way. Uh, I mean, a protein is a protein. In fact, if you take um, the transgene derived factor eight, you measure it, it you measure it normally in the one stage assay or the chromogenic assay, it's, it, and it does exactly the same function. It prevents the bleeding. It participates normally in hemostasis. Why does the body then not recognize it as foreign? We don't know. And perhaps the one that uh, worries some of us uh, is the possibility of genotoxicity. And I did mention that the reason we choose AAV is because it does not integrate. And therefore, if it doesn't integrate, one should not worry about cancer. Uh, and, and, and cancer-related uh, adverse events. But nevertheless, in fact, there were a few of those that were described in, in some of our patients. So if I were to summarize data, this was done on the intention to treat uh, or the total people who were exposed to a uh, valactocogene, roxapavovec. Uh, and you can see that, in fact, there were 24 serious adverse events, uh, less than 20%. Uh, and in fact, most of those uh, were grade three or less. Um, uh, no, very few, uh, only a third of uh, the serious adverse events were, were, were actually great um, uh, three and above. Um, once we have given the uh, transgene, um, you know, sometimes the liver doesn't like it and we start having what we call transaminitis and we manage that with steroids. Uh, 
And of course, steroids, it's a great drug. And, 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 and in fact, we use it all the time, but it has its side effects. And in fact, the majority of the patients that took steroids had some side effects, whether it's weight gain, uh, whether it's hypertension, uh, one of our patients developed diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, ALT elevation was almost a given. Uh, it occurred in 89% of the patients. Uh, and of course, um, um, infusion uh, associated reaction in the total cohort occurred in about 37% of the patients. None of our patients that we enrolled here at Charlotte uh, actually developed infusion reaction. This is when you start the infusion and suddenly the patient says, I'm not feeling well. And, uh, and then you slow it down and they say, it's getting worse, et cetera. We never experienced that uh, in the cohort that we enrolled in, uh, in our patients. Uh, hypersensitivity of in 5% of the patients developed an anaphylactoid reaction. Um, the good news is that, in fact, for those patients that overexpressed the factor, not a single one developed thrombosis. In fact, uh, in one patient who lives in Pinoni, uh, we, we were bringing the patient every week and, uh, and doing so, um, uh, ultrasonography to just make sure that we're not missing a thrombosis because his factor level went up above 400. And, and as you know, the, the higher the coagulation factor, the more likely that you'll develop a thrombosis. And of course, uh, his factor level has come down now to about 250 and he's fine. And, and we never put him on anticoagulant. To do very strange, by the way, uh, to take someone who's a bleeder, you'll never anticoagulate. And suddenly you, you need to anticoagulate because you've overcompensated uh, for the factor that um, um, you know, uh, is overexpressed. Um, in the context of this report, there were no malignancies uh, that were associated with gene therapy. Of course, there were a number of malignancies that uh, were reported when patients were post-gene therapy, and those were intensively investigated, and there was no link between the, um, the AV and the integration and the insertion, uh, possible integration and insertion, and the develop the, uh, development of those malignancies. And if we were to summarize the... Um, the, the safety of our effect, none of the these that were uh, documented in this uh, year two data were apnea, allophylactic reaction, uh, suicide, and coronary artery disease. Uh, we did have one patient who Developer wasn't very high, but obviously the patient had a full uh, set of uh, this fact that this patient actually had a metabolic uh, uh, syndrome. Uh, and some of us wonder why the patient was included in the study to start off with. Uh, it sounded like the patient was a uh, high risk. Um, as I said, every one of the patients, 89% developed elevation of the liver function. In fact, if they didn't get elevated, we know that uh, they didn't go to the liver. Uh, at the end of the day. Um, and we use a, a variety of immunosuppression. The majority of our patients, in fact, um, uh, use corticosteroids. Um, and, and in a small subset of patients, uh, in this center, we use tacrolimus um, you know, to try and control uh, the elevation of the ALT. And, and of course, the duration of the ALT use was very variable uh, amongst the patients. Uh, some patients needed uh, a course of about a week, and some patients were on immunosuppression for a period in excess of four months, uh, which was very, very uh, unsettling for some of us uh, who were looking after those patients. And, and I wanted to perhaps give you a context. Um, these are other studies. Um, and perhaps to just give an indication to put the safety data into context. If one looks at uh, the five studies, uh, all of these are gene therapy, by the way, comparing this study to the other study. In fact, our study actually had the highest number, uh, the, the highest elevation of the ALT. Uh, we, we probably had the highest number of individuals with infusion reactions. We think it's got to do with the formulation of Valactocogen Roxapavovac. Um, the, 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 probably not the highest number, but some of the patients did develop drug-related uh, serious adverse event. Um, uh, two patients, three patients developed anaphylactic reaction. And the good news is that none of the patients across the range of studies have ever developed uh, thromboembolic events 
or uh, neutralizing antibodies against the, the trans gene uh, derived factor eight uh, at the end of the day. And I just wanted perhaps to um, you know, uh, again put uh, the long term um, you know, uh, effect of gene therapy. This is not this particular study, but it's actually the phase one, phase two study. And these patients were followed uh, for a period of um, uh, six years. You can see there up to six years. Uh, having been given the same dose as in this two-year follow-up. This is a, a phase three study. This one was a phase one, phase two study. Uh, you can see here uh, that in fact, um, there is actually no change in the adverse events over time. So once you've gone past that critical period of uh, maybe you know, two months, uh, when they've got elevation of ALT at that it's actually actually become normal, normal in brackets, of course, um, as as you as you'll understand. Um, so so that is an important context. So if you're asking the question, do the patients benefit? And the answer is yes, they do benefit significantly because one can see from um, the profile of adverse events that in fact one is one is actually not in any way uh, compromising the patients. And I did promise that uh, no, this is the talk about him. But I will make for hemophilia. Uh, the gene for hemophilia B is very small, so it can fit nicely into uh, the AAV. There are no issues. And in fact, this comparison uh, probably is the best that uh, one could uh, make. Uh, if one looks at the, um, the eligibility criteria, they were similar. Uh, except that, in fact, in the context of the hemophilia B, uh, they included patients with neutralizing antibodies. And it worked. So, so that actually says a lot about um, the kind of transgene derived fine that you produce that it may well be immune to uh, the pre-existing antibodies. The highest dose that was used uh, is slightly higher in the case of hemophilia A. And the reason for it is because if you use lower doses, in fact, you get even less uh, expression of your factor eight. Uh, whereas um, the, the, the hemophilia B, uh, the dose was two times 10 to the 18 vector genome per kilogram. And of course, uh, the hemophilia B uses a Padua variant. Uh, we use a B domain deleted factor eight. And the reason we remove the B domain out of the factor eight is so that it can fit into that uh, uh, 4.7 kilo basis of the uh, of of the AAV and uh, the long term follow up. In fact, I've got two patients with hemophilia B who got their gene therapy in London in two thousand and nine, uh, and they still express it, and and there has not been any change. And if you ask how long would it last, I think for hemophilia B more than ten years. Uh, for hemophilia A, we we think that it's at least a year, and. We Monitor is that in the case of hemophilia A, uh, one sees a slight drop over time, whereas in hemophilia B, in fact, the level it's truly a, a one and done uh, procedure. You just give the infusion, the patient walks away, and they probably don't need it. We might need to repeat this procedure for the hemophilia B patient, uh, for the hemophilia A patients, and we're still working on strategies on how to approach them. And uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about genotoxicity. Um, no, it is a non-integrating uh, virus, and we've shown that in many instances. And in fact, even if it integrated, you know, think about it. We've tossed out the the rep and the cap genes, so it doesn't have any genetic material. So what will it do if it integrated? Probably nothing. In fact, if it integrated, we would expect uh, the, the person to express factor A gene rather than, um, uh, and we're not worried about the effect of the genetic material of the AV, the disruption in the, 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 the DNA, that is what we're worried about. As you know, that is usually the initiating event uh, in the development of cancer. And there's been some worrying trends that one has observed uh, in neonatal mice, uh, they actually found that with AAV, they, there was a, a large number of integrations that one could see. Some of those, in fact, are shown here next to the albumin locus. There were 68 um, um, uh, integrations in this particular study. And next to the alpha phytoprotein uh, gene, there were 23 integrations. And of course, you know, I, I, needless to say that, you know, you know, humans are not neonatal mice. Uh, Humans are probably very close to uh, higher forms of, 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 of animals like dogs. Um, and, and, and in fact, when this was studied in dogs, 
um, uh, using a variety of technology, uh, we, we came to the conclusion that there may well be uh, an element of clonal expansion as well as an element of integration uh, that one can demonstrate um, in dogs. Um, and of course, you no know, dogs are dogs. Again, they are not human beings. We don't know what the impact of those integrations and um, uh, uh, mean in the context of AAV gene therapy. Um, what what we've done recently, and, and this is a very very large cohort of Hemophilia A dogs uh, in David Lillicrab's lab in Canada. Uh, they've they've basically done postmortems to see, in fact, if any of these dogs. Uh, who are obviously the lifespan of a dog is somewhere between 10 years and 20 years. Uh, the ones that died, uh, was there any evidence that in fact they had developed any form of cancer? And, and their conclusion was that actually there isn't. So with the current knowledge that we have, we do not think that uh, oncogenicity is a, a big issue. Having said that, uh, in a number of these gene therapy studies in hemophilia A and B, uh, you know, quite probably by accident, some patients did develop cancers. Um, there was a squamous cell carcinoma in the BEX uh, 335 uh, trial, not related to uh, AAV. There was a hepatocellular carcinoma in the HOPE B study, that is the hemophilia B study. Uh, and in fact, extensive investigation showed no link between the development of hepatocellular carcinoma and um, the gene therapy that was given. In our own study, there were two patients, one developed an asthma cell carcinoma, and the other one developed a BALL. Uh, I mean, with the BLL, it was not difficult. We know that there is a marker um, for the, um, you know, that drives the, the BLL. And it was easy to demonstrate, in fact, that that marker uh, was not in any way influenced by uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the gene therapy that the patient received. So overall, um, and, and I've summarized here, because each one of these is an extensive investigation and we have not demonstrated carcinogenicity related to gene therapy. So if I were to summarize and perhaps uh, stop, um, I've shown you that replacement therapy, which we regard as the standard of care, uh, in fact has got significant limitations and unmet needs. Um, investigational gene therapy, we're calling it investigational. In fact, it should actually be called therapeutic gene therapy because two of those gene therapies have recently been uh, approved by the FDA. Um, the hemophilia B and the hemophilia A gene therapies are now commercially available uh, as uh, Roctavian. This is now the uh, hemophilia A gene and Hemgenix, which is the hemophilia B gene. You can actually go and buy it off the shelf and ask your doctor to give it to you. Um, and, uh, we think that in fact, given uh, the, the, the data that we've got, the overall risk benefit profile favors that we continue to do gene therapy in the context uh, of um, the patients with bleeding disorders, in particular with hemophilia A. And of course, additional investigation is required. And I'm particularly excited that we're moving away. This is actually gene therapy 101. We are moving into CRISPR uh, CUSP. Uh, we are now uh, exploring ex vivo gene therapy. And those to me, in fact, that will be uh, most exciting than the gene transfer using AV. Given our population that, in fact, uh, the uh, anti-AV antibody rate is very high in South Africa. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions, Zerat. Thanks, Prof.